If you ever wonder why somebody would spend 60 or maybe 90 francs on a number plate holder, here's the reason. These are quick change number plate holders. You just open up, you take the number plate out, and then you put it back in. Very important if you have multiple cars where you're going to switch number plates around. It's not fiddly, it's fast, you don't get your hands dirty. And also you might notice Swiss number plates, they are a bit smaller than other number plates from other countries. So you can't really buy a number plate holder in Germany or something like that because they won't fit. So Swiss number plate holders tend to be a bit more expensive. Ciao, I'm Mario, Swiss car guy on YouTube. And I want to start this video by giving a big thanks to viewer Macho Marta because he suggested in comments of my last video that I change my channel's name from Swiss Review to Swiss Car Guy. And since this made a lot of sense, I rebranded. So now I am Swiss Car Guy, which should be pretty easy to remember. Today I'm driving my 2008 Lexus LS600H, a car I dearly love. And in my last video, I asked you to write the reasons why I love this car in the comment section and that I would post, um, you know, the people who got it right. And there were many, many good answers. But it's usually not just a matter of one thing, it's a combination of multiple things. And in this video I'd like to show you, to explain to you why I love this car, all the various reasons. And then in the second part of the video I will go into cost of ownership because I've owned this car for pretty much exactly one and a half years now and I've just got some builds and I think it's a good moment to make an ownership update. I apologize for the length of this video because it's going to be long, so if you're only interested in the cost part, just skip to the time code that should appear somewhere around here. The car now just thought I was going to crash. Reason number one why I love this car. Well, I'm almost a bit ashamed to admit it as a car guy, but I have what I call a Lexus LS fetish. I absolutely love the cars and I've always loved them since I first saw the first one in the early 90s. I was absolutely fascinated by the car because I'd never seen one of those, I've never seen the brand and it was like this Japanese luxury car, it was something that wasn't really there before and then I learned about the cars, the way they were built, the philosophy behind them and I got absolutely infatuated with Lexus LSs. The other thing is Lexus LSs in Switzerland at least, they are quite exotic. And now you might think, wow, uh, Lexus LS is an exotic car, is this guy crazy? Well, if you're from America or from other parts of the world, yes, then I sound like an absolute nut job. But in Switzerland, <laughs> they have not sold a lot of LSs. For example, in the last seven years, 2013 up to 2019, Lexus sold a total of 53 Lexus LSs in Switzerland. And now you might think, well, you know, Switzerland is a small country, 53 is probably not such a bad number. Well, in the same time period, Mercedes sold over 3,600 S-classes. So for every 68 S-classes you see, on average, you are likely to see one Lexus LS. Therefore, the Lexus LS is pretty, pretty exotic. And voiceover Mario will tell you a bit more facts and comparison to show you how exotic this car actually is. I'm just a voice in your head. There is no voiceover Mario. Grow up. So let's look at data for the entire year 2019. Despite having a fairly new model on the market, Lexus managed to only sell 6 LSs. For comparison, in the same period Rolls-Royce sold 9 Phantoms. They also sold 10 Dawns, Bentley sold 166 Continental GTs, Aston Martin sold 57 DB11s, Lamborghini sold 35 Aventadors, Ferrari sold 164 88s and 92 812 Superfast. McLaren managed to sell 12 Sennas in that period and even 
the Bugatti Chiron managed to outsell the Lexus LS by 2 to 1 here in Switzerland. So there's that. Driving a non-mainstream car. Tick, Lexus LS. But then there's also the other thing that it's probably some psychological issue I have, Crazy. but I'd like to think that I'm driving the best car in the world. With the LS, with these top of the line models, usually they are the best cars the car company can build. And I really like the idea of driving a car that's as good as it gets, that they didn't have to make worse because there's another model on top of it, I find that really, really appealing and it's probably also the reason why I bought the Phaeton back then because VW set out to make the best car in the world. Uh, it's questionable whether they actually achieved it, but I still like this kind of philosophy in cars. I really like the way the Lexus LS look, especially the older ones, the LS 400s, the LS 430s, 460s, 600 up to the facelift. I didn't like the two facelifts they did on the car because the first one they replaced the classic fine elegant Lexus grille with such a chunky one and in the second one they basically changed the entire car and changed the entire interior and I think uh, it's still nicely made but I prefer this old style interior with the touchscreen which the new cars don't have they have some stupid touchpad controller thing that I personally think is terrible they should have stuck with the touchscreens but also I like this bit more conservative style these cars they don't shout about themselves they are just there to serve the purpose of you know you getting from A to B in luxury in comfort without attracting attention and I like that I also really really like the plastics that was used in these old Lexus LS's um, this this texture it's kind of soft but also not it just I love the way it feels it's on all the button I like the way the buttons feel I really just like the way these cars look inside and out a strong point of the Lexus LS's have always been how smooth they ride and most of them are fitted with air suspension they are big comfortable cars they have no pretension of being sporty even though the car has a sport button for the suspension but you know it doesn't do that much it's still a big old boat and this is something I really love because in a luxury car I want comfort I don't want handling if I wanted handling I get a sports car which I do I own an Nissan GTR but I always end up driving this car because for normal driving comfort is something you want and the thing is the car still has power as well it has a 5 liter v8 which produces 394 horsepower and it also has an electric motor producing 224 horsepower the combined output is rated at 445 horsepower and yeah the car can actually move plus being a v8 you even get a bit of a nice sound when you accelerate or when the engine turns on it, it just burbles there and the car being a hybrid of course has Toyota's eCBT transmission which means it's constantly variable it can adjust the ERPMs to basically almost any level which means that when you step on the pedal it revs up and it stays in the optimal rev range giving you the ideal amount of torque and power and when you're not stepping on the accelerator it basically drops down to a thousand a thousand five hundred rpm so the engine is just ticking over and at certain speeds it even shuts the engine off and drives fully electrical in which is really nice it's very smooth it's very nice to drive and it follows the long tradition of lexus ls's with their one uz engines in the ls400 they are just smooth rev happy engines and in this case with electric assistance and with the CVT transmission it's just it's just so battery smooth it's so nice to drive being a hybrid you might expect the fuel economy to be pretty good and to be honest it is but this is still not a Prius the car it's a 5 liter V8 it weighs two and a half tons so you already start out expecting a high fuel consumption in fact 
This car in the 20 odd thousand kilometers I've owned it until now has used 12 and a half liters in 100 kilometers on average, which you will see what it means in like gallons and stuff right somewhere around here. And you might say, well, it's not that great mileage. But then again, if I compare it to my Phaeton that I used to have, that car is similarly heavy, is similarly powerful, and that one did 17 and a half liters in 100 kilometers. So the Lexus actually uses about 30% less fuel, and I do way more city driving in this car than I used to do with that one. So the fuel economy in absolute terms is not great, but in relative terms, it's really, really good. The LS600H is also only available in all-wheel drive, which, if you know me, you know this is a bonus because I like to drive my cars all year round. And rear-wheel drive can be done, but it can also be a bit of a hassle. I did it once. I owned the Lexus LS430, which I drove one winter and I only got stuck twice. So there's that. But then again, I also spun the car out in a straight while it rained really heavily and yes part of it is surely because I'm an idiot but with four-wheel drive you're just less likely for that stuff to happen so I always prefer four-wheel drive when it is available therefore another reason why I like this car the car's smooth ride and general luxury feeling also means it's quiet and it's nice having a car that's quiet because you know it's less stressful while you drive and the other thing is you can enjoy the stereo and this car has a Mark Levinson branded stereo it's good it's actually really good it's not the greatest stereo in the world I mean there's always better things out there but for my taste it sounds really good and what I think is the best thing about it is that it doesn't sound strenuous so you can listen to it for hours and hours and hours even at high volumes and you don't get tired of it and this is really important to me because I like listening to music in the car and also at high volume so there's that and speaking of the stereo this car is from 2008 so it's not that bang up to date yes it's got a touch screen but it doesn't have a USB Bluetooth can only be used for calls. Um, yeah, it can read, I think, MP3 files from CDs and maybe also from DVDs, but who really handles media anymore? So what I did, I installed an Android player in the car. It's called the Grom V-Line 2, and it basically connects to all the factory equipment. You can control it through the touchscreen. You can control it through the controls on the steering wheel. And I absolutely love it because now my 12 year old car, not only does it have all the feature of modern cars, so it has uh, your favorite streaming apps like uh, Spotify or Google Play Music in my case. You can use Google Maps. Um, it supports Android Auto, it supports CarPlay. I think even wireless CarPlay might be coming. But I think it's even better than modern cars because what this thing can do, it can play video while you drive. So basically, I could watch YouTube videos, especially by some Swiss car guy that I think makes pretty decent videos. Uh, no, but if I wanted, I could watch YouTube videos. My passengers could watch the YouTube videos not that I advise doing it, but if you do a long, boring motorway journey, it's kind of nice to watch your favorite, you know, vlog style channels where you don't really have to watch, where you just can keep your eyes on the road, but listen to what is being talked about. And this, in my opinion, makes the car better than even a new car, because in new cars, all these features are usually blocked. You cannot watch video while in motion. Uh, you cannot watch YouTube in the background or stuff like that. And with this car, by only spending $630 for the V-Line 2, I can do all these things. And this is another reason why I love this car. I also installed an app called MacroDroid on my Android phone, which automatically enables the Wi-Fi hotspot once my phone connects to the car's hands-free Bluetooth system. That way, the V-Line always gets an internet connection and I can use all the services. Another reason why I love this particular car that I bought and why I most likely overpaid for the car 
is that it is the exact specification I would have ordered if I had bought this car new. So it's Starfire Pearl Metallic on the outside, light gray leather inside with dark bird's eye maple wood and this car also has the extended leather package which means the dash is covered in leather and also the lower parts of the dash. Another thing I really like is that the lower part of the dash is, is this light gray leather and the top part is black because I don't like it when the top of the dash isn't black because it always reflects in the windscreen and it's really distracting and this car has my perfect chromatic combination because I love bright interiors and this I couldn't have spec'd it better myself and as I mentioned before I overpaid for this car because if you remember what I talked about before they sold probably about you know less than a hundred Lexus LS 600Hs in Switzerland and to find one that's in the very very color combination you might have wanted it's like winning the lottery so I just had to get it and in fact <laughs> I did a big no-no when I bought this car because I bought it sight unseen over the phone and this is something you should basically never do as it is um, yeah it, it's really stupid to do. The main reason why I went ahead with it is that when I was talking with a guy on the phone he was very very reluctant to sell me the car sight unseen because I want to, I, made, I made him an offer and he went like no 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 I'm not going to negotiate you have to see the car first I don't want you to be disappointed and something like that and to me that inspired a lot of confidence because if he was a scammer if he was um, you know a not very reputable seller he would have just said oh yeah sure yeah come on but it took some time it took some explaining because I had to tell him guy I'm in Zurich you're in Geneva I'm not making this three hour trip to Geneva to um, to inspect the car and then come back another time to pick it up so if I come down I'll take the car with me and then we finally agreed on a price and a few days later I was in Geneva and was driving home in this car but of course there are also things I don't like about this car and Lexus LS 600 H's in general. First off this car um, the cosmetic condition is not great. There are some some blemishes and scuffs on the front and rear bumpers which should be taken care of but ah, you know this is basically an almost 200,000 kilometer car and I don't really want to spend money on unnecessary cosmetic things. So the car has a few battle scars and I'm, I'm not worried about them. Same goes for the wheels. I now have the winter wheels, the OEM wheels, which are basically wheels I really like. But in this case, the previous owner had them painted black, which uh, I don't particularly like. And also the wheels are in pretty bad condition because Lexus OEM wheels, in my experience, they tend not to fare very well in heavily salted areas like Switzerland, where I am in and um, therefore they are very corroded and very ugly and basically would need a refinishing and I would personally love to bring him back to stock in the original gunmetal grey but I also really really hate spending money on like unnecessary cosmetic things I mean the wheels are ugly but they are they are safe and they work I'm probably never gonna spend money refinishing these wheels the previous owner did a few more modifications besides the black wheels. He also had all the windows tinted, which personally I don't like, but I can't be bothered to take it off. And also it's useless because the car has sunshades. So why do you need to tint the windows? So, uh. Yeah, another thing is the owner also put on a little spoiler on the rear, which I'm probably gonna leave there because it doesn't bother me that much and because I'm worried I might not get all the glue off if I try to remove it so it's gonna stay and he also did the spoiler lip at the front which yeah I'm gonna leave there I'm already happy I managed to remove all the F Sport badges that the previous owner had stuck on the car that was the very first thing I removed from the car but another thing I inherited from the previous owner are the summer wheels these 
mm, aftermarket, not very pretty 20 inch wheels. And also I, I don't like the way they look. They are not great quality wheels. And with 20 inch, I think the ride gets worse because standard is 19 on this car. Uh, and those, I might do something about them. I might replace them, but the tires are still good. So I may still drive them for a season. I really don't like spending money on cosmetic things, even though it makes probably no sense because I spend a lot of money maintaining the cars in general. So there's that. Another disadvantage of the Lexus LS600 is that the trunk is really small. This five meter long car only has a 350 liter trunk. So it's about half the size of what you would expect from a car like this. And this is because the hybrid batteries are stored somewhere in there, therefore reducing the trunk space. But also I find it actually quite funny that despite having such a small trunk, underneath the trunk there is a full size spare, which I mean is always nice to have, but maybe if you have such a tiny, tiny trunk, why not use that space to increase your trunk? I think they did this with the facelift versions of the car, but mine still has the full sized and unused spare. Another thing I don't like about the LS600H is I can't program the headlights to come on automatically when I turn on the car. There is of course the auto mode that turns them on or off depending whether it's day or night or something like that, but I always drive with my headlights on. Just, I'm just used to do it and I think it improves visibility because when you turn the headlights on instead of just having on day, daytime running lights or something like that, um, the rear lights turn on as well. And I think that also helps a bit with visibility and with not getting rear-ended. But this is a setting this car doesn't offer. I even tried with the tech stream with the Toyota dealer software. There is no option to do this. And for example, in my Phaeton, this could be done via VCDS, the programming software. And in my SL55 AMG, it could actually be programmed from within the menu on the car itself. So on this car, I have to turn on the light manually each time I start the car and then I have to turn it back off. So yeah, that's, that bothers me. Many people commented that the reason for buying a Lexus LS is because it's going to be reliable. And yes, I agree. But does being reliable also mean that the car is cheap to own? I think this is a good moment to go over to the cost of ownership portion of this video. And for this, I will hand the mic over to VoiceOver Mario, because I cannot read off a spreadsheet right now. I am busy driving the car. And also VoiceOver Mario is definitely real and not just a figment of my imagination. <laughs> 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 All prices in this video are in Swiss francs. For your reference, one Swiss franc is about 1 US dollar or 95 euro cents or 80 pence sterling. I bought the car in September of 2018 with 166,150 kilometers for 19,500 francs. At the end of October, I wanted to mount the winter tires, but I realized that I was missing the correct lug nuts for those wheels. A complete set at Lexus costs 500 francs, and so I ordered a fitting aftermarket set from eBay. It cost me 73 francs and 33 cents. I changed the wheels myself this time. See, even I can do some basic DIY. In June of 2019, I had a major service done on the car at 179,468 kilometers. Usually, I have that done right after purchasing a car, but the car was running well and it had been serviced just a few months before I bought it. However, as servicing had not exactly been up to my standards, I had the garage flush all the fluids, including the transmission, and replace the spark plugs. Spark plugs on the LS600H are normally due for a change at 200,000 km, but it's good practice to replace them earlier as they tend to completely seize up and remain stuck in the cylinder heads. And my car was not far from that. It took the garage a considerable amount of time and finesse to get the plugs out without them shearing off. 
Altogether, it took them seven hours of labor to get the service done. And together with parts and fluids, that service cost me 2,342 francs and 80 cents. But I am happy they managed to get the spark plugs out eventually, even if it costs some money. In September of 2019, at 183,415 kilometers, I bought new winter tires as the old ones were completely worn. I bought Michelin Pilot Alpine 5, which were very reasonable 816 francs and 40 cents fitted. At the same time, I had also new TPMS sensors fitted to the winter wheels because they previously didn't have any. I bought four sensors on AliExpress for a total of 80 francs. They were cheap universal ones and they work fine. Shortly after, I had to take the car to its periodic inspection. And I was fairly sure the car would not pass the inspection as I knew the front suspension bushings were quite worn. I also rubbed off the tint from the taillights before going to the inspection as that would have been an instant fail. I even made a video about that. Not only did the examiner note the worn suspension bushings, he also found that the aftermarket daytime running lights installed by the previous owner were not wired correctly and did not dim once you turned the headlights on, as they apparently should. About the suspension I told him the job is already planned and in regard to the daytime running lights I asked him if I could just remove them as I didn't like them anyway. To my amazement the car passed the inspection. Anyway, worn suspension bushings are bad as the car will clunk and the tires will wear unevenly. So it was something I wanted to be taken care of. I also knew well before buying the car that this is an expensive job on an LS600H. The car has 8 control arms in the front and you can only get the upper ones from third party manufacturers. The lower ones are only available from Toyota as they are specific to the all wheel drive LS models and are not the same as a regular LS460. At Toyota here in Switzerland, the parts alone cost around 6000 francs. So I obviously shopped around and I bought the four lower control arms, the lower ball joints, sway bar links and silent blocks OEM from a seller in Japan called Amayama. They cost me 1050 francs delivered. The upper control arms I bought from a third party manufacturer called Febest. I originally wanted to go OEM as well for those, but the OEM would have been another 1000 francs at Amayama, while the Febest were only 320 francs delivered. So I bought parts for 1370 francs, which is already pretty decent compared to the 6 grand that Toyota wanted for the parts. It took me some time to order the parts and the garage was quite busy, so I did not bring the car in for that job until February of 2020. Now, some of you might argue that I could have just bought the bushings for less money and just replaced those instead of the entire control arms. Well, yes. But while you can replace the bushings, you cannot replace the ball joints in the control arms. And chances are that after 190,000 kilometers, they are not in great shape anymore. To me, it would not have made any sense to put the control arms with the old ball joints back in the car. So I opted to replace all the control arms. Also, I cannot press out bushings myself and I have to pay a mechanic to do it. The cost escalates quickly as a mechanic here costs around 155 francs an hour. Speaking of labor cost, this is where this job got really expensive. As my car had been driven for 188,720 kilometers and through all the seasons at the time of that job, all the bolts, fasteners and other parts were completely seized and rusted. It took the garage brute force, some new tools and a total of 17 hours of labor to get this job done. Once they had everything reassembled, they could not align the car since the track rod ends were completely seized up as well and they had to order new ones. Together with two new axial joints, those parts were another 919 francs and 97 cents. So in total, this suspension job cost me a whopping 5,783 francs and 80 cents. And this is how much the car has cost me so far in maintenance alone. 9,096 francs and 33 cents or 5,675 francs and 49 cents per year, or 37 cents per kilometer. But of course, that is not the whole calculation. I also spent 630 francs for the Grom V-Line Android player. Granted, that's not something necessary, but it's something I wanted to have. And of course, there's the running costs. Fuel cost me 5,052 francs, or 20 cents per kilometer. 
Taxes were 2,408 francs and 67 cents, 1,508 francs per year. Insurance was 1,633 francs 20, which is 1,022 francs 50 per year. Altogether, the running costs were 9,093 francs 87 cents. If we add them to the maintenance costs, we get the cost of ownership, which in this case is 18,746 francs and 87 cents. 11,736 francs and 89 cents per year, or 76 cents per kilometer. Now, if I wanted to calculate the total cost of ownership, I would have to estimate how much I could sell the car for now. I reckon the car is realistically worth about 12,000 francs. That would mean a depreciation of 7,500 francs and give me a total cost of ownership of 26,246 francs and 87 cents, or 16,432 francs and 43 cents per year, or 1 franc and 6 cents per kilometer. So far, the LS600H has only been about 1,300 francs per year cheaper to own than that other car whose name always invokes the sound of horror. At 1 franc and 6 cents per kilometer, this is currently the most expensive car I've ever owned. But I say currently, as I have just done this very big ticket job with the front suspension. And that is something I should never have to worry about again, hopefully. Therefore, as I put more kilometers on the car, I am fairly confident that the average cost will come down. But even if it comes down considerably, owning an LS600H will never be cheap. The running costs alone, being at 37 cents per kilometer, mean that even a reliable LS600H cannot realistically be owned and maintained properly in Switzerland for under 60 cents per kilometer. I reckon that once I sell the car sometime in the distant future, my average cost will be around 80 cents per kilometer. So the LS600H has not exactly been cheap to own for me until now, but then again I think the cost will come down over time as the job I just did with the suspension bushings in the front is basically one of the big jobs that exist on this car and it should be good for hopefully a long, long time because now is the first time these things were replaced after 190,000 kilometers. So I hope I don't have to worry about it for a long time. And therefore, in the future, not having these expensive jobs to do, the average cost should drop down. And I plan to keep this car a long time because I don't know if it's come across in this video. I love it. And maybe also because I'm an idiot, but I'm, am I an idiot for loving this car? Is there a car that you love irrationally so? Please comment down below, tell me about it. I'm very interested to read about that. And this video is basically finished. If you found this video interesting, please leave a like, maybe share it with somebody who might be interested in it. And if you want to see more self-proclaimed car guy rambling on about his fetish for old Lexuses, then please consider subscribing to my channel. Anyway, it's finally over. Thank you very much for watching and have a nice day. Nobody's watching this and you're talking to yourself again. Stop it! You're still crazy.